Hello guys, welcome to my channel. So today we are going to talk about JVM and all about its architecture. So if you are new to my channel, please subscribe and let's continue. All right, so let's understand JVM. So think of JVM as the runtime machine. So JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine. So JVM is like the core component here when we run any Java program. So what does it do? So as you know that this is a machine, but it is a virtual ma machine. So you wouldn't see it anywhere, but it runs behind the scenes as in background. So when you compile your code, so when you have your compiler, so compiler is responsible for compiling your Java code as in your dot java file to dot class file so this is your byte code conversion all right so when we convert this using compiler dot java to dot class we get a byte code file now jvm understands this byte code file so what does it basically understand inside this byte code file so this byte code file actually contains a lot of information and that is what JVM looks for. So when we talk about byte, byte code, what does it have? So it is having in layman terms an instruction sheet as in what to do with this class. You can say instructions. So this is what JVM needs to understand and then make out like what to do actually with this program. Now this is the major functionality that JVM does. Apart from this, what does JVM do? So we have heap and we have stack area. We have two different portion of memory area. So we have heap, we have stack. So JVM understands what needs to be inserted in the heap area and what needs to be inserted in the stack area. That is where JVM plays a major role. Then in the heap area, we have GC, which is your garbage collection. So heap area has the long lived objects as in the objects which is going to be there in your entire application execution those objects need to be garbage collected whenever they are not required anymore so gc is going to collect that area as in remove or clean that area for you so that you can create more objects so jvm basically here if we summarize everything so jvm gives you the tools to reason about memory leaks and performance bottlenecks so this is what we have roughly talked about but there is an architecture there is a proper architecture that we should look at and then understand about it now let's take a look at this architecture here so your java program is your dot java file all right so this java file basically gets converted into bytecode as in your dot class file and then this class file gets to your class loader we have three different types of class loader we will talk about it all right so now let's understand what is a class loader so as i said we have different types of class loader so this is going to be a bit detailed so class loader in simpler terms is just going to load your classes this is i think specified in the name itself so whatever classes are being used all those files will be loaded into memory dynamically at runtime so when we compile our code dot java to dot class those class file are not loaded immediately. They are loaded when needed by the class loader. All right. So class loader decides when it needs to be loaded. Now let's understand the loading process. So first step is loading. Second step is linking. And third step is initialization. So loading is going to read your dot class file as in your bytecode and loads it into jvm all right so when it decided that okay now i have to load so it reads the bytecode and load it to jvm now linking now linking is a major step this combines the binary data whatever you have in your dot class file into jvm runtime so how does it combines the binary data into runtime 
so it has three steps here so we have verification so verification ensures that the byte code is valid and secure all right then we have preparation so preparation allocates the memory for static variables if we have any and sets default values that is the preparation afterwards we have resolution so resolution converts symbolic references into actual memory references all right now if you're wondering what is uh, resolution and what is symbolic references so this is the process of replacing symbolic references which is stored in the class file constant pool with direct references in jvm memory so in layman terms symbolic names is the textual representation of other classes fields or methods so text or textual representation will never be recognized by your java or your jvm so that is why this representation or this resolution needs to be done so that jvm and java can actually understand how this variable or how this instance is actually being point pointed towards memory like which memory address and which area of the memory this variable is going to exist so these kind of information needs to be there all right so we have talked about pretty much everything now let's understand the types of class loader all right so this is your architecture and here we have basically three types of uh, loaders so we have bootstrap class loader we have extension class loader we have application class loader and then you can have your own class loader so hierarchy wise if we go so this is going to be the first call this is going to be the second call then third and then fourth if this is there now what happens this is also called as parent delegation model so what does it mean so this means that each loader delegates the class loading task up the hierarchy before attempting to load it itself okay so first call is your bootstrap class loader so jvm calls bootstrap class loader so this is the parent of all class loader all right so this is part of native code of jvm so native code means c or c plus plus so this loads core java classes like from your packages java.lang or java.util all right so these packages whatever they have all the classes will be loaded all right so if you don't know object is the super class of every object class or every class so object comes from these packages similarly we have string which comes from these packages so these classes needs to be loaded otherwise your program will never run then we have extension class loader so extension class loader is the child of bootstrap class loader so this loads classes from the extensions directory all right so when we say directory this bootstrap class loader actually gets the data or the classes from java home so wherever your java is and then there is a folder lib so this is where bootstrap class loader loads the classes from then we have similarly inside lib we have a folder ext which is for extension so this is like your platform class loader and this got introduced in java 9 as the platform class loader all right so this loads classes from your extensions directory and you can uh, say that it loads packages like java x crypto java x dot net then we have the major one which is your application class loader so this you can also say as system class loader which is the child of extension class loader so this loads classes from the class path all right so it loads your projects dot class file and dependencies so whatever you have in your project whatever you have for those class files dependencies everything will be loaded using application class loader 
Now talking about custom class loader. So this is going to be a user defined class loader that extends class loader class. All right. So where you can use it. So you can use it for dynamic class loading of your own. You can use it for network based or encrypted class files, application isolation in frameworks. So whatever works for you, you can use it for that. So I'm just going to give you an example where custom class loader comes into play. So if you know about web containers like your Tomcat or Jetty, so web containers uses custom class loaders per application to isolate dependencies. All right. So this is not a must. This is something you can or cannot use depending on your requirement. All right. Now let's talk about parent delegation model. So why do we have it here? So the current class loader ask its parent to load it. If the parent cannot find the class, it delegates further up. And if none can load it, the current loader attempts to load it. So what does it help with? So it prevents class shadowing, ensures that java.lang.object is always loaded by the trusted bootstrap loader. Now this class loader basically checks in the dot class file. Like what do we have? Do we have static blocks or static variables? Uh, do we need to initialize normal variables as a non static? All right. So all the dependencies as in uh, this class is dependent on other class or not. So all the relevant classes. So these sort of information gets loaded using your class loader. Now everything that we have summarized till here gets into your runtime data area. So this is your memory basically. So in method area, we get the allocation of all the methods, like whatever methods you have in this class and in this Java gets allocated to your method area. Whatever objects you have as in new objects you have, like whatever you have created using this new keyword gets allocated to your heap area. Now Java stack is basically going to be your stack area where you basically have all the method calls and your thread related information. So just to give you a simple example, each thread has its own stack. So your main method, which is your public static void main, this is also a thread. So this gets its own area inside this stack. Now this also stores local variables and method parameters and the relevant calling of methods. So it stores all of that information. Now we have native method stack. So we have seen stack area. Now what is this? So this holds information for native methods. All right. So when you say native methods, what is that? So native methods is your methods written in C and C++. So Java is basically based on these two programming languages. So whatever native methods that we are using from these two programming languages, these gets allocated to this native method stack. So this is used when Java interacts with system level APIs through Java native interface. All right. So this is your data area. Now let's talk about execution engine. So when you have your area allocated, so you have the memory, you have what you need to do now comes the execution as in the actual implementation. So this is the place where byte code actually gets executed. So this is where we are going to execute byte code. Now let's understand each step. So what is interpreter? So just to let you know, uh, this is interpreter and this is compiler. Maybe you are wondering why we have compiler here when we have already compiled the dot Java file to dot class using Java C, which is Java compiler. Why do we have compiler here? We will talk about that. So interpreter is, is going to read your byte code line by line, like first line, then second line and so on till the end of the file. Okay. So byte code is going to be read and executed line by line. 
okay so this is very slow due to repeated interpretation all right if let's say one method is going to be called multiple times within the same java file then interpreter is going to execute the same method multiple times which leads to slowness now this is where just in time compiler comes into play so this compiler comes into the role when we have the frequent compilation as in some areas in the byte code where we have segments which are going to be compiled frequently so just in time compiler does that for you so this improves performance drastically after warm up because this is not going to compile it every time this is going to compile it just once and reduce the slowness all right now we have garbage collector so what does it do we have already talked about it so garbage collector is is an algorithm basically so this automatically reclaims the memory from unused objects so if let's say you have 2 gb of area for your application so this is your heap area now let's say if you have 1.9 gb already allocated to those objects which are already there so you have to check if there are any data any objects inside this area which are not being used anymore so those objects needs to be deleted and removed from the heap area so that new objects can be created otherwise what you will have you will have first of all slowness and then you will not have any area where you can create new objects so garbage collector has a lot of algorithms depending on what you want you can use any algorithm you prefer we will talk about it later now this is all about jvm architecture now let's quickly summarize what we have just talked about so let's understand step by step so you have your source code which is your dot java file now this gets compiled using java c and gets converted to bytecode which is your dot class file all right clear till now so let's say that this is your step 1 now in this step 2 class loader comes into the play so class loader uses the bytecode and loads it into jvm all right so jvm comprises of your runtime area as in your heap area and then the implementation execution area all right so class loader understands your bytecode and loads it into jvm now comes your runtime memory area so let's say memory area now this memory area allocates the memory depending on what we have in our source code so if we have multiple methods multiple variables multiple static variables depending on that uh, jvm allocates the memory depending on whether it needs to be in heap area or in stack area all right now comes the fourth step which is your execution so let's say execution area now what does this do simple this runs your bytecode so this is going to run everything line by line do remember that all right now comes your garbage collector gc so this manages memory so whenever we need to clear memory up gc will do that but it won't be immediate it is going to be automatic depending on the algorithms that we have in our gc now i forgot about jit compiler so jit is just in time compiler so this is going to optimize repeated code execution so where wherever we have repetition of code execution in our execution area jit comes into the play and optimize the performance there because if we don't do that we will have a lot of slowness all right so we have covered jvm now thank you so much for watching this video till here if you are new to my channel please subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for more videos like this have a good day bye bye